Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Artist's Toolkit. Today is about one of our most basic and fundamental techniques. A tool, not an ability, a tool that you all know already. It's about a technique that you can benefit from in the short term as well as in the long term. It's a technique which is often blocked when there are too many expectations placed into it. And it is a technique that is old, well known and always new. And I want to give you a few special, you know, a few special rules for it so that it works for you. This is about the sketchbook. I know, sketchbook, right? Sounds still completely banal. And it is. But still, I'm sure you all have one. And it will work differently well for different people. Some of you will have sketchbooks that you always carry with you and that you keep working into. And some of you will have some, you know, which are a little less full. And for some of you, it will be like it used to be for me. That means you will have an entire stack of wonderful, beautiful sketchbooks at home. And the ten, first 10 pages are always full. And then somehow things came to a stop. That's completely okay. That is what happens with sketchbooks. And I think this is also part because of the term, you know, the sketch, what you think a sketchbook. And when you say sketch, people often think of really, really beautiful classical stuff like sketches by Titian or Delacroix or even by, by, by Artemisia Gentileschi or name it, you'll have it. But you think of really, really fast, beautiful, dynamic, light drawings, drawings made in, in a few moments that capture the essence and the gesture of a moment, perfect line, perfect ease. And um, it makes me also think of sketchbooks that people brought back from their grand tour, you know, in, in, in the history, historically, from about the 16th to the 19th and 20th centuries, people used to travel Italy and Greece to get an education if they had the funds and the means to do so. And I always have to think of the, the German poet Goethe's sketchbook from his big Italian travel and um, his big Italian trip. And that sketchbook is more, it's more like a photo album full of drawings. You know, those are, and those are sketchbooks which are great, but honestly, these were for show. They were not for work. And this is really important. If you want to have a sketchbook that really does something for you, that works for you, that is a tool, then we're back to where we started. Please forget about it being beautiful. <laughs> Beauty is the thing that blocks us, right? You need to get away from the idea, I, the idea I used to have, this idea I wanted a sketchbook that I could leaf through and every page would be wonderful. You know, a, a, a beautiful study on every page, a beautiful, lively sketch on every page. Um, in the best case, something where you can see the humidity in the dog's eye. That's what my drawing teacher, Ruth Tesma, used to say, where you can see the humidity in the dog's eye, the, the, the highlight on the apple, and, or, 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 you know, a, a crazy collage on every page um, that can be translated at once ad hoc into a six meter wall painting or whatever. That is not a sketchbook, that is an artist's book. That's something great, but it is something different. If you want to produce an artist's book, you need to make sketches to prepare. And that is what in your sketchbook. The sketchbook can be dirty, it can have torn pages, it can have used edges, and it should, really, it should. A functioning sketchbook is not like a living room, it's like a workshop. And a functioning sketchbook is your tool that serves you and supports you. That's the thing with the mistakes again. Remember, we had that, mistakes. Nothing new without mistakes. And nothing good can come from a perfect sketchbook. So, how do we do it? For the sketchbook, there are three rules that help to make the sketchbook work for you. To make it work as a as a kind of external memory, as a place where you, you remember stuff and where you store stuff that you may need later. It's also a kind of pantry. 
It is a laboratory, a place where you try out stuff, where things explode and go wrong and you burn holes into the table. And it is also storage space, a space where you put stuff, uh, where, where, where things get dusty, where things are half made or broken and which you may need at some point or maybe never. And then maybe every now and then it may also work as a museum, but rarely. So your sketchbook is a place where you keep stuff that isn't finished yet somehow, that is unfinished, that you're working on, that stuff that may go wrong. And rule number one is one page a day. You work, you fill one page in your sketchbook every day. We here in Berlin, we used to have a very famous medical guy, uh, a doctor who was called Rudolf Virchow. He, um, and he said, no day without preserve. That means every day he preserved some kind of appendix or something. And we don't expect anything like that from you and no need to cut brains into little slices or whatever. One page per day in the sketchbook is enough. And now in front of my inner eye, I can see how people are shocked and oh my God, how are we supposed to produce an entire drawing every day? We also have other stuff to do. Yes. It's difficult only as long as you think there needs to be a finished drawing at every page. And now comes rule number, number two, the second rule. Please, it needs to be simple. And that is important so that you can keep it up, that you can keep it up every day for a year, for two years, for three years, for the rest of your lives. It needs to be easy. Yeah, well, easy. How? Yeah. And that depends on what you put into your sketchbook. You put in your sketchbook everything that you find interesting. And if I say everything, I mean it. It need be a beautiful drawing. You can do it with a minute sketch, in a 30 second sketch, when you see something. You can stick in stuff, you can take photographs and put them in. All these possibilities. And when I say everything that interests you, I mean everything. What can that be? You know, if it's if it's your sweet wrapper that you find on the ground or your receipt for something interesting you bought, it could be you walk, you're going shopping and you see some interesting moss on the rocks and you like it somehow. Photograph, sketchbook. You have an interesting conversation. Somebody says something that strikes you. Okay, write it down, sketchbook. You're sitting at breakfast, looking at your unmade bed and thinking that somehow those, you know, those folds are interesting. Aha, photograph, sketchbook. And then if you have time and feel like it, then you make a study, sketchbook or sketch, sketchbook. You watch a movie that you like, screenshot, sketchbook. Yeah, there's something interesting with the lighting. There's an interesting machine. There is something some cool costume, it doesn't matter what. Take a screenshot, put it in your sketchbook, everything that interests you. The point is to activate your artistic eye. It's about keeping that sense awake, that sense that is always on the lookout for something fascinating, interesting, for something you love, for something that makes you awake, that calls to you. And something that has visual meaning for you. You need to be a little in love all the time. You just need to keep watching for what makes you respond. And that is so easy. That's not so easy at all. Why isn't it? Good question. Why isn't it easy to just keep our eyes open, to keep watch, to keep watching out for things that we find fascinating, that make us respond? Well, we all have a lot to do. A lot of you will just be starting university or going to school. You have so much stuff to organize. You have to sort out your private lives. You have to keep studying new stuff all the time. Some of you may be moving into a new flat and so on and so on and so on. Nothing of this is easy. Sometimes a pandemic happens and we all have enough stress in our daily lives. All the time, somewhere we have to be somewhere on time, we need to get stuff organized and so on and so on. And 
you know, being a student in school or at university or being a professor is very much similar there in, in that respect. That's one thing. We're all busy with other stuff. We're all busy getting our lives organized all the time with time, with data, with numbers and organization. And that is actually not so good for creative work. I mean, we need this ability to create good context and to organize our artistic work. But for being creative itself, unfortunately, it's not so good. I know that's a cliche. That's a cliche. Oh, artists, they're not good at organization and so on. And it is a cliche. It's not true at all. I promise you. Successful artists are really excellent at organizing stuff. Yeah, if you cannot get your stuff organized, you won't get anywhere as an artist. But the point is, you need to take your leave of it from time to time. You need to have space to just look, discover, experiment, and for being curious. And that is, isn't just a cliche or stereotype. That's actually been neurologically proven. So brain research has shown, and you may have heard about that, that the left half of the brain and the right half of the brain take care of different things, roughly put. Yeah, our left half of the brain controls the right hand, and there you go already. In our culture, the right hand is dominant most of the time, and very often the left half of the brain tends to dominate too. And our left half is really good with language, with signs, with organization, with time, with structure. Excellent. The left half of the brain is kind of a manager. And without it, we're lost. It's great. It's great to help us structure our day and make plans and develop strategies and to not to forget about time. And it's good with words. And the right half of the brain... That's the one we use, for example, for making drawings or, or to observe. That's the one that gets activated when we are just doodling away somewhere, forgetting about time and it feels so good. And suddenly we're producing gigantic geometric patterns, which we've never thought of before. So the right half of the brain is the creative one in many ways. The right half of the brain doesn't really know about time in a way, um, it can't really, you know, has no use for time. That's not a term for it. It can probably not really talk in words either. The right half of the brain, however, is really good at intuitively understanding big complex information. The right half of the brain is great with shapes, with colors, with recognizing patterns. It is intuitive. It can process incredibly complex stuff. The right half of the brain can work for a long time without getting nervous or antsy. The left is not so good at that. And if you want to work creatively, if you want to paint or draw or what, do whatever, if you just want to experiment and discover new stuff. Also, if you just want to get into the flow, to forget about time, to play around with shapes and colors and materials and composition and things. If you just want to, yes, to play, the right half of the brain is the one to turn to. Which also happens to be the one that is active when children are playing. Interestingly, right? There is a lot of evidence suggesting that in children, this imbalance between the two halves of the brain doesn't exist in the way it does in adults. So what you need for exploring, observing, creating is to activate the right half of the brain. That's the one you want to get at because the other one will be talking most of the time already anyway. Okay, and how do we do this? That is an important question and we will come back to it in a different session that will deal exclusively with this, with your personal methods for activating your personal right half of the brain. But until then, the point is for your sketchbook, for you getting creative, it would be really good to train your brain to get used to the fact that from now on the right half of the brain is going to put in its five cents too, every now and then, much more often than up to now. Because our society, our culture, our daily life, all is based on the fact that the left half of the brain is more or less the boss. 
And we need to counteract that in a way. And we need to train the right half of the brain to stand its ground and to take a position and the left half to accept that. And that is why we have rule number one every day. Every day you keep watch for things that you find fascinating, that you find inspiring, things that, you know, that produce this kind of ping in your brain, things which are mysterious that you want to keep looking at that are somehow exciting even though maybe you can't even say why and you collect these things and you keep looking for them every day that doesn't mean you have to work in your sketchbook every day you just need to be on the lookout every day to be harvesting to be gathering and you know if you do that in the evening or in the morning as part of your morning routine if you have one um, you know, putting what you found into your sketchbook or if you, and I be, want to be honest about it, that's how I do it, if you do it once a week, just sit down and put in seven ideas or seven, seven things you found over the course of the week, put them into your sketchbook, that's fine. Please find out what works best for you. The important thing is just to be on the lookout every day. That's what counts. Gathering every day. No. Nope. Be on the lookout on the way when you're going shopping, on the way to your handball practice. Whatever is happening, whatever you're doing, keep your eyes open. Where are interesting structures? Where is something you want to keep looking at? I don't care what it is. I don't care if that's lichen on, on the tree or uh, if it is a specialized catalog for plumbers. Or I don't care if you go to the Home Depot for it or... If you go to the supermarket or to the farmer's market or if you just sit in front of your computer, if it's your favorite g computer game or if you have a fetish for nail polish or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. The only thing that counts is that it interests you. That's the main thing. You find it interesting and then it ends up in your sketchbook. So you put in samples of nail polish you put in all the nail polish colors of the season you put in photographs of nail polish bottles uh, sorry for the stupid example or you uh, nail polish well okay maybe you have a collection of keys then you make imprints of keys you draw silhouettes around the keys you put in photographs of keys whatever the one thing that counts is that it interests you deeply and then you put it in there because it is food for the right half of your brain and it will and it will generally help your artistic work and your artistic way on your development and that's why it's so important so to sum it up to make the sketchbook work three rules rule number 1 every day be every day on the lookout if you say i'll take an hour on saturday afternoon to put all that into my sketchbook fine and do seven pages on Saturday afternoon, that's fine. But you are on the lookout every day. Rule number two, everything can go in there. Everything that you find interesting. It doesn't matter what interests you. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. It is completely unimportant what I think about it. The only thing that counts is that you like it. So, and rule number three, it is supposed to be easy no stress of course it is it is great if you have sketches and entire drawings in there and collage photos wrapping paper found objects all of it is equally good all of it is equally valuable if you have days where you're crazily busy and you maybe make just one line on the page in your sketchbook one curve that has good tension great it needs to be easy no pressure because the sketchbook is all about creating math first is gathering and sorting is later the sketchbook in that way gets a very very strong dynamic of its own first of all it helps you to to gaze to look to collect it activates your creative thinking and your creative eye and if you if you can manage to continue this over a longer period of time you will see how entire circles of themes and subjects will become visible, patterns, how things will keep repeating themselves, motives, 
And that is actually the second important function of the sketchbook. It will help you identify entire areas that interest you and you will see which things keep popping up again and again and again. And these will be things that you have a deep intuitive interest for. Also, I repeat it once more. It, I'm supposed to say it five times. Sketchbook, three rules. Every day, everything is allowed and it should be simple. There should be no stress connected to the sketchbook. Those are the three rules. The three rules support two goals. Goal A, activate your right, the right half of your brain. So you train seeing, observing, watching, and you train your artistic eye and your artistic instinct. You allow it to take up space, to grow, to be even more awake than it's been up to now. And you train your perception. You give it space. And aim B is that over time you will find out more about what deeply intuitively interests you, what is deeply fascinating for you. It can be anything. It might be something formal, like you're interested in circles or spheres. It could be something that is more content-based, so you will be in find out you, you're interested in problems of the environment. Or it could be something classical, like you're interested in still life or portraits or the urban scape. All these are things you will find out if you manage to continue the sketchbook over a longer time. And on top of that, the sketchbook is going to be a kind of portable workshop. It has so many different functions. As I said, it can be your pantry where you store your preserves. It can be a laboratory where things are allowed to go wrong. Uh, it can be a storage space where things get dusty. And very rarely, maybe in 2% of the cases, it can be your museum where you have stuff that you want to show, that you want to present to others. And where you say, okay, here is a result. All the rest in the sketchbook is process. Exercises to go with a sketchbook. For starters, get a sketchbook. There are many possibilities. Of course, you can get a leather-bound, hand-tooled, whatever sketchbook. I wouldn't recommend it. Please get something simple. The simplest way, of course, is to grab a stack of paper out of your printers and to put it in a folder. I would recommend a 20 by 30 landscape format. For starters, you can make it larger or smaller later, but please start with this for, be for the beginning. And then you will find out more about your re requirements and then you can adjust it. Exercise number two, please start being on the lookout. When you turn off the podcast, turn around, look at whatever is around you and find the first five things to put into your sketchbook, please. And then please continue this practice every week, all of your life, in the best case. <laughs>